Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Voice of Authority breakfast webinar. Um, and what a way to start. Uh, I hope that bracing start to the day has woken everyone up uh, and got your attention. Um, and what a way to start a conversation about how placemaking and culture affect each other. Who wouldn't want an institution like Mount View in their borough? And doesn't it make perfect sense that Mount View is located in Southwark? My name is Toby Fox. I'm the Managing Director at FreeFox, the marketing agency for councils since 2004. And as part of our work bringing councils and the development community together, we're running a weekly webinar in this slot every Tuesday for a month, looking at the ways in which culture and placemaking are entwined and how changes to each have affected the other during the past few months. And what's coming out of the awful circumstances of the COVID-19 emergency that's worth retaining? What's the silver lining? if you like. That's in addition to our regular Thursday 11 a.m. sessions, where this week we'll be exploring the question, is the growth of smart cities in the UK more vital than ever post-pandemic? And very much hope you can join us again for that. But back to today, where we're working with two of the most thoughtful businesses in the development industry, the developer you and I, and the consultant Inner Circle, to ask how and why are councils, artists, and the development community supporting each other during and post coronavirus. Where last week you may recall we looked at national arts institutions, this week we wanted to have a more local conversation, including artists themselves. We wanted to ask how lockdown has affected the relationship between people, their local places, and the way culture is consumed. What value do places gain from grassroots artists and local artistic initiatives? How can council support and encourage local artistic endeavors? And what role do local artists have in sustaining and reviving town centres and high streets? What role can the development community play? And should places be designed differently to encourage artistic expression? Why does any of this matter? Well, a survey by the membership organisation Women in Film and TV, published in The Guardian over the weekend, found that 67% of freelancers in this sector were unable to access any government support during the pandemic almost a fifth of musicians are considering abandoning their career. Film, TV and music is worth 21.3 billion a year to the UK. It's big business. But on another level, it really matters to us as people. And I'm going to repeat a quote that I used last week because it sets the scene for us really well. Art influences society by changing opinions, instilling values and translating experiences across space and time. Research has shown that art affects the fundamental sense of self, Painting, sculpture, music, literature, and the other arts are often considered to be the repository of a society's collective memory. On that note, audience, charge your coffee mugs and get that caffeine surging through your veins so that you're ready in about half an hour to play your part in the conversation today. We're going to start taking questions for the panel via the Q&A function on your screens a little after 9 a.m. Between now and then, we'll be running some snap polls to perhaps feed that conversation and to feed the report that's gonna follow this session. But we're gonna spend some time first in the company of some excellent people who are gonna stir and stimulate us with their experience and their insight for the next 30 minutes or so. It's a great pleasure to welcome our panel this morning in alphabetical order. Oliver Goodall, co-founding partner, architect, we made that. Councillor Peter John, leader of Southwark Council in London. David Lockwood, Director at Trowbridge Town Hall Trust, and Sandy Perez, Management Consultant, Managing Consultant at Inner Circle Consulting. And finally, Sarah Priest, Executive Director at Mount View Academy of Theatre Arts. Oliver, turning to you first. Set the scene for us. What's the role that the design community plays in fostering arts and, and culture uh, in our communities? How is uh, We Made That working with local authorities to reimagine how places are designed? Thank you, Toby. Um, so I think it's clear that London's a city that's known globally as a place to consume culture. But kind of creating and producing culture is important too, from set making and rehearsal spaces through to artist studios, all these things add up as part of that kind of ecosystem. And when I talk about culture, I, I talk about it in, a, in an everyday sense. It should include pubs and barbers and high streets and the activity of kind of everyday life. And of course, at this particular time, there's challenges around that. 
And I think it's important, and it's always been important, that people are involved in shaping culture and that we enable routes to participation. So I wanted to just go through a few slides to kind of quickly zoom in, I suppose, from a large strategic scale, um, which is looking across the Thames estuary, down to the scale of a chair leg. And I think that enabling routes to participation is incredibly important, both historically, but as we react and recover um, from the coronavirus pandemic. So the Thames Estuary Production Corridor, the largest scale looking across the entire Thames Estuary, having a strategy for how we develop talent and cultivate ideas, and then respond in terms of what space we need is incredibly important. And I guess positioning that as part of the government's industrial strategy is a large scale bit of thinking about how we can shape places successfully. But then in London, I think we need to think about spaces around the back of high streets, spaces where uh, things are created and things are produced. In this case, a study for the GLA on artist workspace and how these spaces are adaptive, how they are affordable and how they are part of those, those neighbors in which they, they operate. We think that's really important. And I think it has a, a role to play um, and a care that's needed to think about that future evolution. Quite clearly, and I suppose the Oxford Economics bit of work and the Creative Industries Federation uh, made clear some, some uh, quite extreme headlines, I suppose, around the, the changes expected to cultural spaces and the creative sector. But there's, of course, a whole range of people producing and making to support that. And can continue the zooming in in London, I suppose this also comes to the kind of creative enterprise zones particular neighborhoods in London, and we've worked across five of these six, where thinking carefully about skills and support and opportunity for participation, as well as space and planning policy, all need to be leveraged to kind of get good outcomes. And clearly at this time, those great enterprise zones will need to adapt to new opportunity as well. And these include mapping and thinking around things the back of high streets things in sheds things in unexpected places all those things are part of that ecosystem and i think we need to remember when thinking about routes to participation and enabling recovery just how that we don't just concentrate on on the things that people consume but also those places of production and that the recovery and response needs to respond to that at the same time um, we've been working in, in Thamesmead on London's first kind of cultural infrastructure plan or local cultural infrastructure plan. And I think this sets out uh, an ambition in terms of alongside delivery of large scale regeneration, just how culture can be a series of kind of everyday activities. You know, these are places to spend time outside and parks at the moment are, are of course, a place where people are spending a lot of time. But how people come together in these spaces is a challenge now when it was just the most everyday form of culture and spending time together. And I want to end really on thinking about how we scale down, all the way down in this case, to a furniture leg. This was a, in, in Wheelstone in Northwest London, the Wheelstone Youth Workshop, where we were working with a range of 16 to 19 year olds, designing, producing, prototyping furniture for a high street public space. And I think the key thing here really was that we were able, working with them, to test and trial opportunities on the high street to bring production, to bring making, to bring young people to the forefront of what that, that looks like. They produce these fantastic bits of furniture which, are, which were available for sale, but they have now sold out and were uh, exhibited in the Barbican and other places. But I think in some ways, this is also for these bunch of 16 to 19 year olds, an opportunity to find roots into producing and making, creating and taking an active role in their neighborhoods. I think that's the thing that remains and will be incredibly important moving forward.
Fantastic, Oliver. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Councillor John, Peter, um, in, 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 feel free to, to take up the, the, the threads from that. I, I'm quite interested to find out about a, a, a local cultural infrastructure plan and whether, whether Southwark's looking at, at one of those. But how, how can councils support local arts and, and culture groups during the, the pandemic and beyond? And, and how will design and place shaping be affected by the pandemic? What impact is it going to have on, on consumption of, of culture in Southwark, do you think? Wow, massive questions, Toby. Um, I mean, I think it just in terms of, you know, where we are in Southwark, we've always believed that culture has an essential part to play in our community. Um, you know, even when many other local authorities were cutting their culture grants back in 2010, 2011, at the start of austerity, we continue to support institutions like the South London Gallery, the London Bubble Theatre Company, the Blue Elephant Theatre Company, because they were uh, organisations which were really working in the heart of our community. I, I can think of many projects the South London Gallery has done with neighbouring uh, estates, bringing people into art, and quite challenging art, I guess, um, you know, in a, in a way that just wasn't happening before. Now, what can we do during this crisis? Um, I mean, the first thing is to stand by those organisations that we have supported in the past. And, you know, I think we've been pretty unique as a local authority supporting uh, particularly arts educational groups and institutions to come into the borough and we're going to hear from Sarah uh, in due course but Mount View that have been in uh, Haringey uh, in uh, North London for, for many years have been looking to find a new home in that part of the world and, and um, a chance conversation with one of our regeneration officers meant that uh, Mount View moved into Peckham and is in its new headquarters. Thanks significantly, I think, to financial support from us as a council, a loan from us, um, you know, in, in tens of millions of pounds. Um, and, you know, that has, I think, brought a new vibrancy to that bit of our borough. I think it's opened again the doors of culture to many people who might never have experienced uh, the arts and culture. And, um, you know, so, that, so that's been a complete trailblazer. Blazer. It, it set a, a precedent because then other organisations have come to us and said, oh, you know that deal that you did with Mountview, do you, do you think you might be able to help support us in this particular project? Um, and so the Central School of Ballet, um, which is moving into the north of the borough, we're supporting them with a, uh, a loan facility and also uh, a great institution like the Old Vic, um, we're supporting together with Lambeth uh, a loan for them and their annex project. And in all of these cases, we wouldn't be doing it unless there was a massive quid pro quo for the community, support for, you know, from these organisations going out into our community and working with young people in particular, uh, Toby. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, because um, all three of those organisations have come back to us during the pandemic and said, can we renegotiate the terms? can we talk about how we're going to repay this loan? And, you know, in all three cases, I think we've been utterly positive and constructive. And in some cases, the dialogue continues. But, you know, that is where we can help them at this particular time, because their work is so essential um, going forward. So, you know, that, that, that's where we're going. And I think in terms of where will culture be? In the future, in terms of designing places, and I was really interested in what Oliver was talking about. I mean, I, I think, you know, so many councils have based regeneration in recent times on having a, something at the heart of a regeneration, particularly a cultural offer, that we can't walk away from that approach now. It would be utterly, you know, the wrong thing to do. So I think culture will stay at the heart, but absolutely recognising that, you know, it is the one sector of the economy which is still in, in the least certain position. You know, we, there's really no sign of things easing off and that massively important sector of the economy coming back on stream anytime soon. Thanks, Peter. But before we move on, there's, I don't know, there's a sense of irony in the arts institutions relying on local authorities for financial support. And that, that's where the, the sort of focus of, of your piece there was, uh, is the financial support that you can provide at a time when local authorities are under more financial strain than, than perhaps they've ever been. Um, and I want, uh, what, what's the sort of the ability for, for local authorities to sustain that, that support? Well, I mean, in Southwark, we've been able to do it because we've had a healthy capital 
budget and and you know healthy capital balance our revenue budget is shot to pieces and has been for the last decade but you know in capital terms we, we've got some resource there that's going to get tighter as it goes forward but you know an organization like mount view coming into peck and taking a massive site next to the library um you know which has been architecturally applauded but never quite worked as a place it doesn't quite work as the place that we would have hoped maybe it should have been i think mount view has cemented that so it, it's you know none of none of what local authorities do is completely selfless this is about creating you know a cultural hub in the heart of peckham so it works for us it works for the community fantastically it works for mount view brilliantly well um but um you know we're, we're not driven by kind of purely financial motives we're driven by the, the the desire to create communities and you know as i said that's why oliver's uh piece was so interesting in terms of what's being done in almost a more formalized way yeah knitting it's almost sort of knitting the pieces together at, at, at that level isn't it um david um in in trowbridge i don't i don't know what sort of what levels of, of envy you might be looking on at the conversation so far in uh, we, we we talked about lambeth last week we're talking about southwark this week the, the multi-million pounds of sort of support for arts institutions from from local authorities um, moving out to your, your, your part of the world, is it an entirely different kind of conversation? How's the pandemic affected what culture your town hall in Trowbridge offers to the community? And, and, and will social distancing have a lasting impact on that? And as a community organisation working to establish a programme of cultural events, how, how will the way you engage with your public change? Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? And it's, it's interesting um, how I'm trying to answer your, a lot of your questions in advance of this, how little COVID actually seemed to be the, the defining issue for us and how when it did, it was just a question of amplifying things, trends that were already there. Um, I don't look on it uh, with envy though. Trowbridge is a fantastic place. So Trowbridge Town Hall, which is in Wiltshire, uh, it's a Victorian building. And as with many other cultural organisations, our aim was to bring people together into the same physical space, literally breathing the same air. So the pandemic closed buildings and everything stopped. Many cultural organisations, other cultural organisations, transferred their activity online. But we'd already become a facilitator rather than a creator of content, so to pick up on Oliver's point there. Um, so for us, that wasn't appropriate. Uh, moreover, I think that role of enabling culture, enabling culture, rather than offering it, is key to what we're doing and what I'd suggest could be the future for most cultural buildings. What we're striving to achieve is a system where the community creates culture. And again, as with Oliver, we're pretty broad in our definition of culture, extending it to anything that makes life worth living, um, which could include a walk alongside a river or a magazine read for pleasure, as well as things that we might more traditionally um, class as culture. And interestingly, on that point, you know, the, the, the story that was fed to all of the, the broadsheet newspapers says that culture is gonna restart on the 4th of July. And I'd argue that the greatest act of cultural expression happened in the last few months with no money and it was people putting rainbows in their windows, making and then putting rainbows in their windows. Social distancing will cease at some point and we've already seen, uh, we're already seeing a relaxation. Uh, but that role of enabling a community to create and nurturing that creativity, I hope that lasts even when we can be within a metre of each other. As I think those days of patrician culture are starting to fade and I'd say not before time. In fact, I think as in other areas, notably the increase in use of digital technology, all we're seeing is a leap forward in changes that are happening gradually anyway. We've seen a greater democratization of culture in the last 20 years. So for example, popular taste determines what gets made by Netflix. And I want to find ways of us harnessing that in Trowbridge. I also think there's something here around creating the circumstances for sharing of activity, all the world's a stage. So how do we, as a building and with a digital platform, enable people to express themselves creatively and share that with other people in the same geographic place. Another question you asked me is how can local authorities support organisations like ours? And I think that's by removing themselves from the field of play. My experience working within these structures is relatively recent, only 10 years, but the building I look after has been around for 131 years. When it was built, it housed the local authority staff both of them, the town clerk and the town surveyor. Whilst I know the peak of local authority resources in the past, many councils still run museums, galleries, performance spaces and festivals. Understandably, 
This can create conflicts of interest between generating activity or revenue for themselves or enabling it for others. A creative culture thrives in many circumstances. It needs freedom, but also boundaries. It needs praise, but also honesty. It needs resource, but also benefits from barriers. It likes to be supported, but it also likes something to fight against. But the thing creativity thrives on more than anything else is creativity. Ideas spark ideas. Creative people encourage others. So by putting people together, cheek by jowl preferably, but digitally can work too, you end up with a culture of creativity that not only makes a place better to live and work in, it also makes it more prosperous, healthy and harmonious. Fantastic, David. Thank you very much. Um, can you give us a, a, an idea of the sort of size of, of the population that you're managing? What is your, your audience? So the so Trebridge area is 45,000 people, so relatively small. Yeah, okay. And, and do you have any, any idea on the sort of proportion of that population that you're engaging with? Oh, yeah, fraction. Um, 5%. Um, so the, the organisation that's running the building is relatively new. And that's one of the challenges is that, is that for most people, it's a part of the, the building is part of the, the furniture of the town. So they walk past it, this massive iconic building, they walk past it, they've got no idea what's going on inside. Yeah, great stuff. Okay. I'm sure that's a that's a, a common story across across the land. Thank, thanks very much for, for those, those insights. Um, Sandra, you, you've uh, worked in, in Wiltshire, you've worked in, in a, as in a circle, worked in a, a number of parts of, of, of the UK. What's the value um, of culture in, in the post coronavirus era, in, in your opinion? And, and is ensuring a healthy future for arts crucial to, to development? Uh, will town centres be designed differently with, with the consumption of culture in mind? Yeah, thanks, Toby. Um, so from the point of view that we operate in as, as consultants, I think one of the, the most critical things for us is, you know, finding ways to actually quantify that value. Um, because a lot of times when we talk about the value of arts and culture, we sort of start with, you know, how arts and culture illuminate our inner lives and enrich our sort of emotional world. Um, but the reason why that is, is because it actually enriches our lives in, in many other ways. So it, it, as, as all of you have picked up, it contributes to your health and well-being. It contributes to um, sort of education, um, economy, etc. Um, but I think understanding that causality between, you know, culture as it's happening and how that actually ends up in, in a sort of quantifiable way um, that we can use in, in decision making, really, um, is, is really critical. And it hasn't quite been cracked. Um, we've tried to, um, and I think, you know, within, within our company, we develop tools and we've developed models, um, to try and, and, and look at that, that link between, um, activities and benefits and outcomes. Um, but you know, that to me, to me, that's like the most critical bit, um, in terms of, of making culture happen and ensuring that the funding is there as it goes forward is really understanding um, what does it lead to? Like, how does it contribute in, in a way that is measurable and, and you can evidence um, across? Um, the, we've seen it make a massive difference in, in projects in the past. So as David says, I don't, I don't think, you know, we've changed our, or the value of culture hasn't changed because of coronavirus. If anything, it's just reinforced it. Um, in past projects, you know, like the EMD cinema in Waltham Forest um, or even just little projects um, as one of the projects, you know, we worked with Oliver on, on this Wheelstone project and you can see the difference that it is making in people's lives. It's just how do you actually begin to measure that? Um, I think one of the areas that I've seen have the most impact, especially in the last couple of years is mm -hmm. in council officers job titles. Um, you know, we're shifting the language between regeneration and growth into, uh, for example, in Newham, you have community wealth building, which to me is, is a really kind of big statement about what it is that councils are now focusing on in terms of, you know, creating um, and regenerating places. Um, the, and, and also the way that that, um, that funding is being evaluated, um, especially from central government, I think it's very much being pushed into this more evidence-based um, value creation um, for 
Trowbridge, um, we are working on a future high street fund bid. And um, it, it is being sort of um, evaluated on a cost to benefit ratio. Um, but the majority of the benefit, especially when we're looking at projects like the Trowbridge Town Hall, um, it is very much about finding ways to to look at the the sort of um, how we're we're how that's contributing to um, well-being, uh, to tackling social isolation, to improving health outcomes, to improving education, um, and actually monetizing these in a way that we can put against the investment that we're making. Um, one thing that struck me, uh, we did a consultation event last week and actually how positive people are about the, the future and about the, the value of culture. They, they, there's a really wide recognition that culture, um, activities related to culture have a really big role to play in the reopening of high streets, um, in bringing people back to high streets and in helping them engage with high streets in the future. Um, and David picked up on the point about agency. Um, I'm part of my local community, you know, with a completely different hat on. Um, I sit on, on my community's uh, parks group. And I think some of the biggest barriers in, in making culture happen has to do not so much with the desire to do culture the, or the, the activities that are ready made to put into high streets. It's actually with some of the more mundane things like, do you have the right type of insurance or do you have the right, do you understand the right processes to get the right permits within the councils? Um, so, you know, when, when Oliver talks about things like an ecosystem, creating an ecosystem, it's not just about spaces, but it's also about expertise. It's about, you know, what roles each individual uh, component has to play the council, cultural organizations, uh, the bigger organizations, you know, in cities. Last week we saw the Young Vic and how they're working with smaller organizations. It's how they all begin to contribute a little bit um, to that bigger picture of culture. So um, I think to me that's the way forward, um, making those links much more stronger. Um, I think it's a really important part of it. Fantastic, Sandy. Thank you very much. Right, come on, audience. We, we need your questions now. Start them rolling in. Uh, before, we, before we turn to answering them, uh, Sarah at, uh, at Mountview, um, as one of the UK's leading drama schools, um, how's the day-to-day -day running at Mountain View changed since the coronavirus outbreak? And how does it, or how do you intend to, to run in the long term? Um, how will Mountain View's presence in Southwark shape the borough uh, and, and vice versa? Uh, you're on mute, Sarah, sorry. <laughs> that old one, still on mute. That's, that's, the beauty, that's the beauty of uh, the, the, the remote working. Yeah. Um, my team are uh, rubbing me all the time about that. Thank you very much, Toby. Uh, and thank you to the audience. And in particular, great thanks to Peter, John, uh, our leader uh, of the council, who has, as he quite rightly said, supported Mount View uh, to be able to reimagine itself um, with a permanent home in the most fantastic location of Peckham, right in the bang centre of Peckham uh, Town Centre what a gift that has been for us and what a partnership it has been over this um, time that we have been in, engaged with you as a council. I think it's a real testament actually to how, how the industry, the cultural industry, uh, arts and education sector can work with councils. It's a very, very good case study. Um, and while he's, he's right to say that we are knocking on the door saying, help, this is a very, very particular time. This is a very challenging time for the council and for us. But I think this is a long-term uh, uh, partnership and it's a long-term uh, solution to a, a short-term we hope problem um, so we are committed absolutely 100% committed to ensuring that the council gets every single penny back of the money that it's invested in us and more in terms of the value that we bring to the borough because we have not only we're not only are we one of the top five drama schools in the UK so we have uh, a national and international reputation uh, and we deliver um, uh, to the, you know, as I say, we're on top five in the, in the UK. So we are contributing uh, to that industry and the creative industries uh, is one of the largest in the UK. It's one of the largest contributors to GDP. This is, this is the lifeblood of our UK economy. I, and I think if I think about how people understand the arts, um, we, have to, we have made the case, we try to make the case to, for people to understand that, you know, two million people are employed in this industry and 98% of our graduates go straight into employment. The whole of the West End, 70% of the shows in the West End have Mount View graduates in it. Now, in terms of how, how um, 
we we will be working how we're working now is we have transferred everything to online onto digital this is a this is the equivalent of the puritans closing down theaters and reimagining ourselves and inventing the restoration uh, form uh, we are reinventing ourselves as a sector we are doing everything online we're delivering 200 classes a week we've transformed uh, transformed all the young people's work onto an online platform and they're doing fantastic work we've been given challenges integrating communicating connecting um, while we are have, but while our building is closed We've, we've given our space over, some of our space over to the local um, Southwark Food Bank so that they can utilise our space while we're not there. Um, and we very much sort of want to hope, hope that we can keep using our building uh, for as long as it's necessary uh, while we are remotely working. The other things that we've been doing is that we've set up a whole series of uh, online conversations. So Giles Torreira, who is a Mount View alumni, he's a board trustee, and he is probably best known for his uh, sort of starring role in Hamilton. He has been hosting um, Mount View Live for us, and we have been uh, having conversations with our students, but also with some fairly significant industry professionals, so Judy Dench, Amanda Holden, Nomad Mizwaini, uh, and he will continue. There's some more names coming, so keep an eye on the Mount View Live uh, website because some great people are going to be on that, on that uh, platform. Um, so we have reinvented ourselves, but we are not physically together. Um, the thing I was, as I was listening to the conversation a moment ago, I was thinking about how this, this format, this is, I was thinking what we need, what will be coming down the track with, with the social distancing that we're experiencing and the devastation that's going to have on our industry. And it is going to be devastating. There's no doubt about that. And we are trying to lobby hard to government to say, you must support us because we are a massive industry. One in six jobs in London are in the creative sector. Um, and we are looking at potential losses you know, freelancers, 70% of freelancers are going to lose work. And we think that about 26% of, um, of income is going to be uh, lost. Um, and it's a large scale. If you think about the, the London's West End, you can't imagine it without people buzzing around, the tourists coming for our galleries, our um, exhibitions, our theatres, our concerts, and our architecture and historic contributions culturally that we have, we have created over generations. Um, so they ha we have to be supported, um, but I think the, 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 the thing I was thinking about is how um, the new localism really, that, that um, there will be, of course, we have fantastically rich town centres in London, um, and so is a very, very good example of that. And we will become, I think, much more reliant on our local provision because transport will be more difficult. We will be starting to be more local in our, in our activities day to day. Um, in a way, the localism will be the new globalism, I think. And if you also flip that in terms of this platform, the new globalism, as we reach out to people regardless of boundary, which is an, almost like the new local. So I think there's something really sort of interesting. I think this, it's a seismic shift in our culture and our systems. Um, and if I think about, um, if I sort of think about, you know, the, the our sort of creative careers uh, and how our contributions to the economy, uh, the creative infrastructure, uh, and how we kind of create space and place, and then the creative community, and what a creative community we have all over our, our, the UK. Uh, but um, in particular for, for us in Southwark, we think it's an incredibly rich borough culturally, and in culture in, in all senses of the word. Um, and I sort of think the final thing to say is I think we, are, we must be very, very conscious that we are hitting a, a perfect storm. We have had the Brexit not yet hitting us. We know it's coming. But at the moment, it's on the on the back burner. It's going to come, and it's going to have a massive impact for us. The COVID, with the social distancing, um, and then I think in particular, if you think about our school children, they have the school curriculum has been losing its arts provision for many, many, many decades. They have now been out of school. They're going to go back into school, and what's going to be on the top of their list? English, math, science. The arts are going to be absolutely decimated. And so again, we must make provision for connecting and creating um, communities, infrastructure and opportunity for careers in this industry. Fantastic, Sarah, passionate and articulate. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Oliver, coming, coming back to you, um, it, it, maybe there's, a, there's an opportunity there for you, for you to pick up on in, in terms of school children and, and their exclusion from the arts, if you like, um, uh, due to uh, being shut out of school during coronavirus and then having other priorities when they, when they go back. Is there an opportunity for the sorts of projects that you were talking about earlier to, to, um, to cover for that to some extent? Um, but also more, more widely, a question from, from the audience. Um, 
uh, and, and one that sort of plays into the heart of, of our audience for these sessions, which is from Michael Stanworth, which is around um, how we can help developers work up schemes with culture at their heart. Um, so, so uh, have you got any sort of messages for, for the development industry out there about, about how they can ensure that, that culture is, is, in, is ingrained into, into new schemes and how the places they create can, can, um, can be creating venues for, for what Sarah described as, as the new local? Yeah, I think it's been uh, kind of fascinating to get that quick fire overview. And I think kind of picking up on what both Sarah and David have, have made in their points is the opportunity to open up institutions, buildings to the public was always an agenda, right? There was always the desire to, to reach out into those communities to, to make institutions um, the perfect neighbour within their neighbourhoods. And I kind of remain curious to think about whether these kind of digital participation uh, platforms and other things that are going on will break down that threshold between the kind of front door of maybe imposing uh, kind of institutional buildings and other things. I suppose there's also an opportunity as perhaps the office market is fundamentally restructured. But actually, is there going to be space available either in the short term, the medium term or the long term for some of the challenges that London faces certainly around affordability of space to produce, create, exhibit um, cultural activity? Um, is there an opportunity where actually with the heat going out of some of that market is an opportunity to, to refigure things. Maybe that's around community wealth building, maybe around different factors. Um, but also, I guess the flip side is maybe, Sarah talks about kind of um, food bank using space within Mount View. Is there actually a set of ingredients that might come to the fore with institutions and with other kind of others operating in the, in the, in the development world? Um, where those institutions become places and homes for other things that wouldn't otherwise be part of the core activities previously, you know, more community outreach, more working with young people, maybe just a place that is a, an informal space. Those things seem to be the, have the potential to be very positive outcomes out of this process. Yeah. Although not without discomfort for some. Sure. D David, looking um, at, at um, your, your area, uh, presumably you're seeing sort of new developments happen um, a, a, a around town centres and, and on outlying parts of, of, of Trowbridge, uh, new houses being built, new communities um, coming in. It, do, you, do you sense any kind of opportunity there for, for um, more, more cultural activity to be ingrained into that process? Do you see any engagement with what you're trying to, trying to achieve? So not really. So the context is, um, so the, a housing, housing development, loads of houses are being built in Trowbridge um, over the next decade. Uh, that will increase the population. So that makes a significant difference, obviously, in terms of what you need to then provide for them. But in reality, the um, developments that have happened in that town, I'm relatively new to the town, I've only been there for a year, but developments that have happened to the town over the last sort of 20, 30 years, potentially even a century, as one of our, our new trustees has said, century of decline, century of poor planning decisions that have meant that, that things have taken, have gone away from the town centre. Um, and in terms of cultural provision, there's a challenge, there's always this challenge, and someone's, someone's asked this question about kind of patrician culture, um, of whether you build something outside or you bring in an established partner so the vna have just built something in in, in dundee and there's tate and st eyes and in liverpool or whether what you're doing is enabling a community business and we're seeing a great growth in community businesses and again it's this thing about democratization that comes as a result partly as a result of changes in digital technology which means that you have changes in society so then things that are owned by the people our building was built for it says on the plaque outside for the benefit of the inhabitants of the town forever. And that's as relevant in 2020 as it was in 1889. And what does that mean? So how do we enable this building, which was built for the people, to be used by the people to do within that what they want to do? But that can extend, right? That doesn't need to be the big iconic building in the centre of the town. That can also be, and Oliver was talking about, kind of more informal spaces. How do we enable people to be able to, do, to turn, you know, an, an empty space into a, 
a meanwhile art gallery or an, or a studio and not worry that they won't that they only last for six months or two years or whatever that's okay because as they go other things need to come along and that's how you kind of create that sort of vibrant vibrant cultural life i think is that your experience in in Southwark, Peter? Because clearly you're you're at the heart of of that that uh, that tension, aren't you? You're bringing in and have have been for for many years now these fantastically successful institutions in into Southwark. Um, but but how much is that actually nurturing uh, local activity, or or how much is it displacing that that activity or, or taking over from it? Well, I mean, I think it's I think it's nurturing. Um, you know, if 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 I think around the borough, I mean, if, if, if you think about what's, what, what's happened in Peckham, Peckham's become a, a kind of cultural hub. Now that's happened because, you know, you've got the South London Gallery, you've had bold tendencies, you've now got Mount View, you've got the... So I, kind of, I think it kind of feeds off each other. You, you know, you can be the catalyst for it as a local authority um, and kind of create the right conditions. And that's what we sought to do. Um, and it would be completely self-defeating if, you know, what you were doing by bringing a, uh, an existing organisation in um, was to drive someone out. That would not be the idea at all. So, I mean, I, ho I hope we've acted as a catalyst. I mean, another good example is, is for instance, um, University of the Arts, which obviously Campbell College of Art, you know, just on the edge of Peckham, but, you know, they, they will be having a new headquarters, you know, new London College of Communication, the Elephant and Castle, which is going to be magnificent for students there. And again, I hope we'll help create more of an ecosystem um you know responding to the uh lcc in that part of the world in Walworth, you know so a slightly different part of the borough um so i think we, we we bring people in to be catalysts not to drive existing artistic communities out i guess i mean you could you could there could be an argument that that um that peckham's kind of current uh role as, as a creative hub for you in, in Southwark started with um, with the new library all those all those years ago which which completely changed certainly in my mind i remember writing about it and producing the first issues of of Southwark magazine it just changed the whole image of, of peckham as a place just by having a building that looked creative yeah you know and, and, and winning the sterling prize all those sorts of things made a massive difference i think the um you know the square outside it has 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 worked in part but not fully and i think that's why the addition of mount view kind of helped cement that um going forward um so yeah i mean i i, I think peckham has kind of been on the up for quite a while but it kind of reached a tipping point probably five six years ago i'd have thought where where bold tendencies became established and i think peckham just became seen as kind of an icon of um you know modern artists to, to live and work and practice what, what, what sort of role are you taking uh, as, as a council in development and encouraging development to, to, to nurture the arts, to create creative spaces and so on? Is, is that an overt theme for you or is it, is it a sort of byproduct of, of the kind of place they're developing in? Um, no, I mean, I, I will always challenge, particularly on any big scheme, you know, what, what, what is the anchor here? What is, and normally I'm looking for a cultural anchor, you know, what's, what's the thing that makes this housing a place a bit like Dave was saying you know Trowbridge has built housing but has it has it brought culture as a, an essential part of that and I, I, I like to think we're different in that we do challenge absolutely and sometimes you end up with something completely different but again another for instance which which goes back many many years but the but where the bridge theatre is now at one tower bridge the council there always insisted that there should be a cultural user in in, in the ground and lower ground floor um, space at, at that development um, and I think seven or eight times I went out to the market to see you know who was there and what one stage it was going to be like a mini model of London and you know all various different ideas but eventually the right user comes along and and then cements Tower Bridge with the Bridge Theatre um, as again you know a new cultural destination which is fantastic and again has opened up opportunities to people living in the area who might not have been able to afford or chosen to go to the theatre to go to the theatre. Tank Modern is, you know, Southwark's ultimate example of, of how, you know, a cultural user can absolutely change a place. Of course, yeah. Um, Sandra, um, 
feel free to pick up on, on any of the themes discussed so far, but, but also um, uh, we've got a question from Mary Helen Young around uh, bids and, and businesses, private sector. And what, what, what's the sort of, um, what's the capacity there for encouraging uh, investment and, and support from, from bids and, and, and local businesses to, um, to nurture culture? Yeah, um, I suppose one of the, the areas where I think it's not necessarily that there's been a shift, but it's being more widely recognized and, and perhaps not as as um, maximized at the moment. It's the, just a vast amount of resources that there are um, around. Um, it's not just about councils funding culture or uh, external organizations funding culture. It's a really important part of it, um, as, as I'm looking at David. Um, and, and I know that, that you know, having the money to do things, to run buildings, to pay the bills, to maintain the infrastructure is key. But also, um, as I said before, it, it's around um, the, all of the other resources that can add up to something quite significant. Um, so I think, I do think bids have a role to play in this uh, because ultimately, you know, culture and having a rich uh, and varied program of culture in a place drives footfall, which in turn uh, brings benefits to businesses, et cetera. This is what I mean about how can you begin to tie in the, the causality of, of, of and the value um, of, of culture and cultural activity. Um, but it means that those networks have to be in place. Um, and often I think that can be the biggest challenge. Um, so, you know, yeah, I, I think that's the, the, the main thing. Um. With um, Sarah, with, with um, the sort of the, the private sector uh, uh, funding of, of, of the arts, that um, another viewer has pointed out that that was often seen as a kind of impure kind of way of, of supporting the arts. And, and the arts has been encouraged to develop its own kind of revenue uh, sources. But it strikes me, and I'm, I'm no expert, but it strikes me that the arts institutions that have been most successful um, in, in recent years in, in commercializing themselves and generating their own rev revenue streams uh, are the ones that have built you know, restaurant businesses and bar businesses and, and, and merchandise businesses and all that sort of stuff. They're the ones that have been hardest hit by COVID because there's no one there to consume those, those products and they've got no other source of funding. So, so is, there, is there a lesson there going forward, do you think? Do you think um, sort of private... Uh, support private investment is going to become more important again and, and is there anything wrong with that? For me when I think about sort of private public we're, we're all people trying to have a life and trying to support other people to have a life that's rich and meaningful um, and we need to find mechanisms to to work in partnership because that's what unlocks um, the, the opportunity. Certainly if I think about when we were in Wood Green we were living in a, a, a on an industrial estate uh, we've been in what was determined as temporary accommodation when it had moved out of its original home uh, into temporary accommodation on this industrial state. We ended up being there for 30 years because we got locked in by a market that became very uh, bullish. Uh, so rents were very high, prices were very high. We got priced out of the market as an organisation. And we had two million quid on the balance sheet. We, we are one of the top five jump stores in the UK and we could not make the move. So we had to find a way to unlock the funding. And we didn't just come to the council, we raised six and a half million quid through philanthropy and through, uh, through the GLA and through individual trusts and foundations, through people, you know, people contributing out of their pockets. So we, we had our, our building was built through a mixed economy. Um, and, and in terms of you're quite right, in terms of we have worked very hard to diversify our income. We were hugely reliant on student fees. Uh, but yet with the bullish market, we couldn't increase fees because you can't pass on that level of inflation to, in a competitive market where fees are capped in the university HEI sector. So we were sort of in a, between a rock and a hard place. But what the council were able to do is to lend us the money. Uh, they can borrow money at much, much cheaper values than we would ever be able to. We would never be considered for a bank loan of the scale that we, that we drew down from Southwark. And so they were able to unlock that. They tied us into a deal that means that we give community benefits and we, we give bursaries, we give free, um, free places to, to, student, to young people in our, in our community, free tickets, we've created jobs. We have um, 14 million pounds worth of economic uh, activity. A lot of that is spent in the borough. So we are, we are a generator of, of income for other people. Um, so I think it's a false, false kind of um, definition to sort of talk about public-private. How do we kind of come together as a community that represents all of these different stakeholders 
and, and decide we want to do something and make it happen. And it's about then what we do for that money and how we then have a business model that is able to, to, to strive, uh, thrive and survive. This is a particularly unique set of circumstances and our trading income has been massively hit. Um, thankfully, we have, because we've been able to convert to digital, we've been able to keep our organisation going and our core income is still coming in. Um, so we are probably, uh, unlike others, who are worse hit than, than we are. We've sort of, we're sort of in the middle band probably in terms of the, the impact on us. Um, but I do sort of think that we, one of the things that we need to recognise is that we need to invest in the communities uh, and whether that's through infrastructure, like a, a, a building like Mount View, uh, or whether it's in actually finding ways to uh, support the people who are at, naturally active. So, for example, I was thinking as I was listening to the conversation about how, you know, the whole thing about COVID has been, or, or coronavirus is, is about neighbourhood. We've Our neighbours have suddenly rocked up and hit a saucepan uh, and, you know, we have become neighbourly. Who knew we had that in us? But we have, and, and actually, as someone who works in Pe Peckham, I've been part of a number of forums, for example, Town Centre Partnership, um, the sort of the Creative Enterprise Zone. I've been sitting around a number of tables, and every time I sit there, I think we need some support to help us administrate these forums, because we can do the job. A bit like with Southwark. Southwark don't, don't do art. They, they support, they create the conditions, as Peter said, they create the conditions for other people who do do that stuff to do it. So if we, if, if developers and, and councils can support the infrastructure, then the people in the community will do the actual work, but we can't do it without that level of support. Um, and I sort of think that f funding, for example, neighbourhood forums, neighbourhood town centre forums, management forums, we can, we can activate the cultural sector, we can activate the community, we can activate the traders, we can activate young people, we can self-organise, but we can't do it without some level of, of support. Thanks, Sarah. Dave, David, that sounds pretty much like uh, that's a role for you, right, in Trowbridge. What, what's, what's the role for me? You're, 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 for um, other people will do the art. You're, you're there to, um, to provide the activation, to, to, um, not to provide, to provide the support, the, um, yeah. the framework around it. Yeah, that's interesting because we're, of course, not a local authority. Yeah. Um, we're, we're, a, we're a cultural organisation ourselves. And, and, and I'm quite interested in, in the way in which more cultural organisations can behave in that way. Um, and this, this is sort of what I mean about that kind of patrician culture, you know, that, 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 the, um, that we make all of the stuff ourselves rather than trying to enable things. I'd be really interested in a theatre that is led by its outreach department rather than by its artistic director putting on the work on stage that they want to make. And that's not to devalue the, you know, artists making the art that they want to make. I think that's really, really important. But I think that, that the balance at the moment is, is, um, uh, is still so much more towards the, the individual maker and more within theatre, which is the medium that I come from, than, than I'd say in, in, other, in other art forms. Yeah, absolutely. Oliver, um, you you mentioned earlier the um, the production corridor, the mayor mayor of London's production corridor, which extends all the way from London out to uh, to Medway, I think, to to the east coast. Um, initiatives like that, we're all very well versed in initiatives like that. We're, we're, we're well versed in in, in grand sweeping programs um, for which a budget is is put in place. But um, we've got a, a viewer, Susanna Wallace in Barking and Dagenham, who's who's asking about who's talking about some great uh, programs and initiatives that that have been introduced there. But her concern as an artist is um, that the programs all come to an end. You know, the funding ends, the political cycle ends. Uh, the developer who built the scheme that supported that that program uh, has completed and, and gone away. How, how can you, how can you ensure that the the work that you're doing, which is uh, so fantastic and so well received by the audience, they're, they're um, uh, jumping jumping up and down um, to to congratulate you, but but how can you ensure that it's got some sort of permanence that it, that it endures? I think it's a a, a really valid question. Um, how do you make that endure? I guess we, we talk a lot about infrastructure. I mean, the um, working with those 16 to 19 year olds in Wealdstone required infrastructure, required the council to have secured money actually as part of a larger scale regeneration program, including housing, the relocation of a new civic center, thinking about how town centers could be reworked and re-enlivened. Um, all those things require infrastructure. I suppose the the lesson that we've learned at a range of scales is 
how do we get out the way quickly? In some ways, the, the, it shouldn't sound trite, but I suppose the quicker that we can make space for others to get involved and therefore to sustain things in their neighborhood, the neighbor, neighborhoodliness thing is a, you know, who knew? But actually, I think people really, really care about their, their places. If you go and try and have a conversation with someone in the street about urbanism and the forthcoming master plan, there's a, a kind of the potential for a glazed look to come over people's eyes. If you talk to them about what do you want to see in the neighborhood, what do you care about, how do you spend your time, who do you interact with, people have stories, they want to talk about it. And so I really think that that neighborhoodliness still has always sat there. There's just different expression to it now. And I think one of the challenges we've, we always have is, is matching the scale, I suppose, of the Thames Energy Production, production Corridor. You know, central government investment, industrial strategy scale thinking, down to what that means for a bottom-up way of working. And yeah, I, I really do think that the job of us as consultants, because ultimately we, although we enjoy being embedded in places, um, I mean, there are others in, in, in Barking and Dagenham, everyone every day, for example, doing fantastic work there, um, is actually how do you sustain that long-term and adaptive thinking? And that requires um, people to get out of the way so that those can, can, can forge forward and perhaps with a different plan to what might have been imagined in the industrial strategy, but still, I think, to hand over to those that are, are capable and willing on the ground has, has huge value. And the subtext there again is that that idea of the sort of patrician approach to to supporting the arts, which which uh, people take against, don't they? The, the top down, um, you must do this and you must do it here. Um, and what you're what you're suggesting is that um, that the quicker you get out of the way, the, the the better. Sandy, you wanted to pick up on that. Yeah, just just to really quickly build on that because I think that, that is a challenge taking the, those big sweeping strat strategic pieces of work. Um, and translating them into specific places, into specific solutions for that are needed for the specific area. Um, and a lot of that comes to, from brief writing. Um, so how do you actually translate and make a deliberate move as you're writing the brief for a building, for a public space, for a you know public realm road reconfiguration project to actually enable these things to happen? You can't just you know expect that if you if you build a town square that culture will happen is what are you putting in place to actually uh, say to whoever is going to occupy that space we want this sort of activity to happen here um, so I think I think it's it's that in some ways that's the role of the local authority like making sure that you're writing really good briefs that actually say exactly what it is that you want to happen in those places um, and making sure that those are informed uh, by the people that live in the place um, because otherwise, I think there's a really big danger that we're building, you know, buildings, places, uh, high streets, etc., that mm. aren't, you know, enabling culture to happen. Um, culture is not just about buildings. It's about, you know, the space in front of the building that you can then occupy with a stage and have a festival. Um, so it's, it, I think it's about that, that sort of bigger picture and how that translates into that much smaller scale. Um, that is also really, really key. Fantastic, Sandy. Thanks, Peter. Um, I, I know if you want to, to pick up on that, and also perhaps um, tell us a bit about how you understand what local people want in terms of culture in Southwark. I mean, what kind of engagement process is there that's feeding into those briefs? That's 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 creating those uh, parameters for people to operate in, where they where they 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 feed the arts in. They they make culture part of everything that they do. Well, I mean, I suppose there are the formal planning processes that you go through in terms of, you know, developing your new Southwark plan and culture plays a part in that. Um, you know, there are always ongoing conversations and consultations going on across the borough. 18 months ago, we had the Southwark conversation. There's another piece of work which is going on at the moment for the next uh, six to eight weeks, particularly in response to Black Lives Matter protests um, and how we can better respond to our community there. Because I mean, I, just on that, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious at times that, uh, you know, the audience and participants in, in um, you know, cultural events and cultural organisations are, are, you know, are too white and too middle class in, in many ways and are not reflective of what's going on in the community around us. And that requires hard work. And, you know, Sarah talked about kind of the work that we are doing, some of the outreach work and how, how do we bring people in. 
and I think we're having successes. You know, it, this is not kind of like a, a you know story of failure at all. But I, I think it's I think, and and that's why working with schools, we had a program which is on hold at the moment, free theatre tickets for all of our primary school kids to go once a year to theatre. Um, you know, so it's projects like that, getting people in, you know, getting yeah. youngsters in early. So I think there's a whole range of things that we do try and talk uh, uh, to, to people. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes it is driven by the passion of the politicians as well, um, who want to see culture at the heart of, of what you're doing as a borough. And it's been kind of one of the things that's driven me since 2010. So, yeah. well, so some of clearly is an absolute benchmark for, for, for that process. And Sarah, I know you, you were telling us um, before we started about some of the fantastic work that you're, you're doing around the Black, Black Lives Matter, um, but we haven't got time. I'm really sorry for that or, or for many other uh, questions that the audience have put to us and uh, a conversation that could, I feel, could go on forever. But what a fantastic contribution from, from our panel. Um, uh, thank you very much indeed for, for giving us so much uh, food for thought. Um, and, and I'd like you if, you, if you can, to picture now cereal bowls and coffee mugs being hurled into the air as viewers across the land erupt in, in applause for your contributions this morning. Thank you very much um, to Oliver Goodhall, co-founding partner at The Architect. We made that. Councillor Peter John, leader at Southwark Council. David Lockwood, the director at Trowbridge Town Hall Trust. And Sandra Perez, management consultant at Inner Circle Consulting. And Sarah Priest of the Mountview uh, Academy um, for Theatre Arts. Um, Thanks also to you out there, our brilliant breakfast audience. Come and join us again next week uh, at the same time when we ask how do COVID-19 and social distancing affect the delivery and value of borough or city of culture status. Uh, we'll be supported again then by our excellent partners, you and I, and Inner Circle Consulting. Before that, on Thursday at 11, we're exploring is the growth of smart cities in the UK more vital than ever post-pandemic? And you can book your places for these sessions and watch a recording or read the report from this and all of our previous sessions at thevoiceofauthority.co.uk. Until next time, from our panel, from me, from everyone at 3Fox, good morning.